Welcome to Global Brief Studios. It's Irvin Student here, Editor-in-Chief and Publisher. Welcome to our Fall 2012 issue, the first in our fourth year. Uh, Global Brief is launching in Asia this year, likely in Singapore. Uh, we've had launches to date in the U.S. out of Stanford, in Western Europe out of The Hague, and in Canada out of Toronto, Montreal, and Winnipeg, with launches in the next year to year and a half in Eastern Europe, the U.K., and France. Uh, thanks again to our global readership for your loyalty, your comments, and your support. We're delighted to be here today with my uh, friend, former colleague, and uh, a terrific Canadian analyst who's just come from Baghdad with United Nations Assistance Missions for Iraq, visiting professor here at the Glendon School of Public and International Affairs, Sven Spengemann. Sven, thanks so much for, for, for being in Global Reef Studios. Thank you, Irvin. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be here. It's great to be affiliated with uh, the Glenda School of Public and International Affairs. Now, Sven, you wrote a couple of issues ago for a Global Brief, and we're, we're going to have you in our winter 2013 issues. Just give readers a taste of, of where you think things are going in Iraq right now. So Iraq has moved into a, a very different phase now after the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in December of last year. It's, uh, it's a much more stable phase when you compare it to the original um, basically Bedlam, almost civil war of 2005 through to 2007. Um, the stability has come with a price. It's basically political deadlock. We see a lot less violence on the street, but we see very little political or constitutional progress. Um, and we see a lot of meddling from the neighboring countries. A lot of politics in Iraq are directly related to uh, the Sunni side and the Shia side outside the country. So it's mm -hmm. extremely difficult for Iraqi politicians to to maintain their course, to, to carve out some independence uh, from that external influence. What are the key two or three decisions that need to be made by, by leaders in Iraq or opponents of the leadership uh, over the next little while? I think uh, there's, there's a whole series of issues, that two big ones that do need to be addressed, I think, are the, the status of Kirkuk, the contested oil-rich city in the north of Iraq, the, uh, the surrounding areas of which are still uh, very much prone to violence, to sporadic violence. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are multiple um, competing narratives, ethnic historical narratives relating to Kirkuk, and they're, uh, quite simply speaking, irreconcilable. Uh, so some uh, thought will have to be given how to move forward on Kirkuk. And I think the second issue is the, the question of hydrocarbon management, the exploration of uh, Iraq's tremendous hydrocarbon wealth by the accounts of some. It's, uh, it's in the neighborhood of 150 billion barrels. Um, it's quite significant, uh, but much of the oil is still underground. The production capacity hasn't uh, been ramped up to the levels that Iraq could produce at, uh, primarily because the political factions are still divided on how to how to share the wealth once uh, the oil is being produced. Sven, how much are, are border dynamics affecting I Iraq's reality, uh, first in Syria and then in Iran? I think there are significant uh, issues with respect to border dynamics. Uh, first of all, refugee flows, as we see now. Uh, initially, there was an outflow from mm -hmm. Iraq into Syria. It's now the reverse. Syrian refugees are coming into northern Iraq, Nineveh mm -hmm. province in particular. Um, another issue that's come up very recently that's uh, quite controversial and has uh, drawn the ire of the U.S. administration is the allegation that uh, flights, uh, supply flights are coming from Tehran into Damascus through Iraqi airspace, uh, basically breaking, breaking the embargo against, uh, against Syria. Uh, without being inspected. So if that's true, this is actually a very real, tangible possibility of, uh, of prolonging the uh, conflict in Syria. and mm -hmm. something that needs to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, what is the role for uh, the West and, and, and Asia in, in, the, in the future of Iraq, in any, if anything? I think the entire international community has a huge potential to become a stabilizing force in Iraq. Um, Iraq needs strong international partnerships, not just from one or two key mm -hmm. allies, but from a plethora of international uh, partners and potential economic partners as well. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity uh, from Asian countries, notably China and Iraq. Uh, mm -hmm. These partnerships are uh, producing stability because they're helping Iraq to find its way forward economically. Uh, but I think the important thing is that there not be a polarization of who Iraq's partners are that there be a multitude, that the West reaches out to Iraq as much as the East does. Yeah. Um, you, can you give our readers a, a, a taste uh, of what you'll be writing about in, in, in the winter 2013 issue? You talked about, about certain moral courage and, and, and some other issues. Can you, can you give us a little bit yeah. of a... I, I think there's, uh, th there's a, a new injection of polarization, of radicalization uh, that we saw over the last few weeks in the entire region uh, through the video that came out on YouTube. Uh, there are new moral questions that were, that were latent um, during most of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was seen as an opportunity, as a breath of fresh air. Uh, many of us gave it the benefit of the doubt. Let's see what happens here. Let's see if it's something constructive. Uh, what happened over the last two weeks really raised a moral alarm bell. 
what I wrote about in Global Brief last summer was the prospect of creating what I call the virtual civic network, so civil society networks from established democracies or open governments, not yeah. necessarily democracies, that would reach out to Iraq and would help the emerging regimes to find, it, find their ways forward in terms of constructing not only the government apparatus but also civil society. With Given what happened in the last couple of weeks now, I think the, the moral questions have become much more, much more sharp, much more um, profound and need to be answered. And um, there, are basically, there are basically two ways to look at it. The one is, uh, one proposition is that true moral, moral courage in the world, across the world, is the act of standing up against extremist, in extremist uh, behavior, extremist expression in your own midst. Um, and uh, the follow on then is if this moral crisis plays itself out in the virtual in the virtual global commons, ought we not as individuals have an obligation to stand up to say something and mm -hmm. to try to temper this reflex to resort to violence? We're all connected to Twitter, we're all connected to YouTube and to Facebook. Um, if we sit passively and let this kind of behavior play out, um, I think we've lost an opportunity. So it's all, we're almost at the level where an individual can incite and conduct foreign policy or at least raise serious foreign policy questions. So the entire analysis is less about civic action networks at this point than to go all the way down to the individual and ask uh, a basic moral question, which is basically what is the participation uh, of a citizen, a global citizen today in the virtual, what is the duty to participate in the virtual global commons uh, and to try to change behavior that way. Do you think that duty to participate or the, the, the moral courage of which you speak or the civic, civic action networks uh, are more conspicuous for the Middle East than they are for, for other regions of the world or, or, or is, is, is it quite similar for other parts of the world? I think at the moment it's uh, particularly uh, relevant with respect to the Middle East, but it's, it's a broader question. I mean, there are moral crises that could flare up anywhere, uh, and the same question is raised. If I have access to the global commons and I see something like that, and I run a blog or I run a Facebook page or I have a community of, uh, of friends uh, who I could influence to stand up against this, don't I have a new uh, obligation to, to take that route or at yeah. least to look at it seriously? Sven, we're greatly looking forward to having you write again for a global brief. Uh, I know that, that our readership has requested it for a while, and, uh, and, and good luck in, 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 in your new roles after, after the UN. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you, Irvin. Great to be here. Thanks. Mm -hmm.